doesn't, doesn't uh, large amounts of anesthesia numb out the consciousness you want to have as you're dying? Well, it depends, I think. I think that, uh, yeah, large amounts. But after all, when you die, you become also, and it, you become analgesic. You don't feel your body anymore. That's part of the process. So accelerating that a little bit, I think, in, uh, I mean, you, uh, 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 Dale already said, if you can manage a little pain, and it's kind of nudging you along, and you're mainly focused on keeping an open mind, then it's, you don't need much more, or you don't need anything. But if your pain is really distracting you from what's happening and you're only freaking out about it, then you're just accelerating the natural leaving the body. I think it's perfectly OK, actually. I think that you know, the, the medical people are so <laughs> nervous about you know, on some kind of drugs, but at least they can't think that the person in, who is dying is going to become addicted. <laughs> <laughs> end up, end up on the Bowery or something. You know, they're going to end up in the cemetery in any case. So, I think it's not it's not too drastic a problem. I don't think so. There is a kind of a related issue that I have seen several times. Hospices, because of the fear of death of the hospice staff, yeah, that's possible. Overly medicating yeah, that could be. patients out of all consciousness is completely overloading them with uh, very strong drugs, just assuming that who would want to be around for dying uh, in a way that was really quite unnecessary. And I called attention to that in a few cases. They called up the hospice. Hospice actually apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't really know what we were doing. Right. And, then they, and then the person was able to kind of be reconscious again, if you will, and had a wonderful final few days with their family. So yeah. hospice might make an assumption that isn't necessarily the way you want things to go. So you, you should be very clear about what your values are, having these advanced directives, having conversations with relatives and physicians and things. Mm -hmm. Steve was going to ask. Oh, yeah, Michael Newton book would be very helpful. Yeah. I think but so. That there's something to do beyond just letting her do what she wants to do, which is letting her know that you are available to talk about anything if she wants to, without saying, without in any way implying I will, will draw any kind of love if you decide not to. So that the message is, it's up to you. You're setting, you're setting the boundaries here about what it is that we, we can talk about. And if you make the boundary really small, in no way will I pull back from you. But I'm here to talk about anything that you might want to talk about. The, the other thing I think that's important is you yourselves read those books. Yes. And then they're in, it's in your mind. Yes. And you'll become engaged with that, you know. And I think you should look at the Book of the Dead. You should look at Michael Newton. You should, uh, and, and then you, every Stephen Levine's thing, the one, the second one, not who died, but the other one that you said. Healing into life. And, and then death. when you're, f you, this is in your presence, you know, these ideas and these feelings are in the presence, which you will go through when you read them then you will be in this presence that she might then ask you something or talk to you, say, you know, I've been reading these interesting books and here they are, and I really was engaged in this and the other. And it's like, you know, sharing a novel that someone read, you're sharing so different stories, different perspectives, and you're sort of confident in those perspectives. And then that's, that's a big thing for the people, you know, I think. You know? It's not a matter of reading it to them, right? Oh, it's to yourself having it in your mind. And then they, they might want you to share with them something. Another thing that I like is there are some, there are, you know, mm, that, you know, like Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, uh, some Sufi things, Rumi, reading beautiful things that have beautiful imagery in them, I think is also very good. There are some things called, known as the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra, but it's a little heavy for someone who doesn't know, but these amazing visions of sort of, beautiful, heavenly spaces. The Indian imagination is incredibly rich with them. And um, people just, just great, beautiful imagery, you know, like beautiful places, you know, fields of flowers, you know, like things woven in like tapestries streaming from heaven, you know, with extraordinary embroidery sort of thing. Just things that get the imagination into bright and, and brilliant and pleasant sensations and colors and things like that, I think is very pleasant for people. And I think the idea that 
there might be really wonderful places to go, and there are really beautiful perspectives on reality. I think it's very helpful to people, that's all. It doesn't have to be some Buddhist thing. It's just different world systems. Our Western imagination in our spiritual writings is very slight, actually. There's not much. If you think of the, the different Bibles, how many descriptions of heavenly halls are there? Very little. You know, Isaiah sees some wheels turning, some guy in a fiery chariot. Or, but the actual, you know, the throne rooms of, the, of, div of divinities and things, there's very little description. Whereas India, Indian literature has huge descriptions. Pure land of Krishna, dancing around with gopis, and I don't know, it's really quite so lavish, amazing. So it's worth helping people by reading some other, something from some other culture, I think. Especially when you have it in your own imagination, this kind right. of, or cheery vision. It's very helpful. <laughs>